Hello there. Let's learn about some figures of speech through this presentation. Now, the first figure of speech that we shall be dealing with is apostrophe. Now, what is apostrophe? Let's look at the following sentences. O oh Shakespeare, great power in your words. Dear trees, we owe you our life. Hey, Sachin Tendulkar, you played great matches. Why are you so elusive, wisdom? Now, in all these sentences, what we see is that there is a direct address. What is common in all these sentences? There is a direct speech. Now, this direct address is done to whom? In the first sentence, it is being spoken to Shakespeare, who is in no position to reply back or respond because he is dead. In the second sentence, the direct address is to trees, which is inanimate and therefore cannot respond at that point of time. Now, here's Sachin Tendulkar. Look at the third sentence. Sachin Tendulkar is alive but absent at that point of time, in that context, and therefore he cannot respond. Similarly, the fourth sentence is a direct address, but this is a direct address to wisdom, which is an abstract notion. So, therefore, this is also an apostrophe. So, if you see here to sum it up, what we see is that apostrophe is a direct address to either the dead or an inanimate object or a living person, but who is absent at that point of time or to an abstract notion. So, it's a direct address to these four elements. Now, if we were to define apostrophe, an apostrophe is a direct address to the dead, absent, inanimate or abstract ideas or notions or entities. Now, let's move on. We shall now do two figures of speech together and they are Oxymoron and antithesis. Now, why we are doing them together is because both of them use opposite or contrasting ideas. And therefore, more likely that people get confused between the two concepts. So, let us see, though the two of them use opposite or contrasting notions or ideas, how they are used makes all the difference. So, let's look at the following examples. Now, in oxymoron, if we see, her sweet bitter words hurt me and he became a living corpse. If you see, both the opposing words, sweet and bitter in the first sentence, are used together in close proximity to each other. They are used in conjunction with each other. In the second sentence, he became a living corpse. Here also, living and corpse, the two opposing ideas, are used together in close proximity or conjunction to each other. And also, one more thing we need to note in oxymoron, and that is that sweet and bitter is used for one entity, that is words. Similarly, living corpse is used for one entity, that is he. Let's look at antithesis. Her bitter thoughts were concealed by her sweet words. So, here we have again bitter and sweet used, but bitter is used for thoughts and sweet is used for words. They are not used in conjunction or together, but they are used for two different entities. Similarly, he became a living person with a dead mind. Here too, living person. Person is one entity, dead mind, mind is a second entity. So, opposing ideas or contrasting ideas are used for two different entities. We can see a classic example of antithesis in Neil Armstrong's words. When he set foot on the moon, he said this, Setting foot on the moon may be a small step for a man, but a giant step for mankind. So here again we see two different entities, that is man and mankind. And for man, small step, for mankind, giant step. So this is an antithesis. So now we'll proceed to define the two terms. Oxymoron is defined as the use of opposite or contrasting ideas in close conjunction with each other, while antithesis is the use of opposite or contrasting ideas, phrases, clauses or sentences for two different entities. Now we move on to the next figure of speech and that is called synecdoche. Synecdoche has two types in it. Let's see the first one. Here if we see, he asked her hand in marriage. Now he asked her hand in marriage. In fact, he asked to marry the entire person. But when we say, we say her hand in marriage. So part for the entire person hand. 
hand for the entire person. The captain commands 100 sails. Similarly, 100 sails, it's actually 100 ships. But the sails is part of ships and therefore it is part for the whole. So here in both the examples, we see part for the whole and this is called microcosm. This is because it's a part. So it is microcosm. So synecdoche of the microcosm type. Now we'll see as against this, another two examples. Another set of examples. The department announced the results. India won the match. Now, department is made up of people. So, instead of saying that the set of people belonging to that department announced the results, we just say the department. So, it is the entire word that is used for the parts that make up that word. Similarly, India won the match. So, instead of saying the players of Indian team won the match, we say India won the match. So, which means it is a whole used for the players that make up that team. So, here we are seeing that's whole for the part and this is called a macrocosm type of synecdoche. So, there are two types of synecdoche that is microcosm and macrocosm. And to define synecdoche, it's a figure of speech which allows a part to stand for a whole or for a whole to stand for a part. Close to the heels of synecdoche is the term metonymy. Now, this is also a figure of speech which is usually confused with synecdoche, but they are actually very different. Now, let's see how. Metonymy comes from Greek word metonymia, which means change of name or a misnomer. If you see here, they supported the handicapped. So instead of using the word handicapped, I could use the word differently abled. Another word, but very closely related and actually similar in meaning to handicapped. So we use the word and then we make the sentence, they supported the differently abled. Now words can win battles. Instead of that, we see pen and sword we could use. Pen is mightier than the sword. Now, we must note here that pen is not part for part of words. Okay, So, pen is another word used for words and sword is another word used for battles. So, what is metonymy then? It is defined as a figure of speech in which a closely related word is used instead of a usual word. Now, the usual confusion between synecdoche and metonymy is very very prominent and therefore we are going to now see what is the difference between the two terms. Synecdoche is very clearly part for the whole or whole for the part. It can be very easily seen like give us this day our daily bread. Bread is part of food so you can see that it's not another name for food. It is part of food while metonymy is very clearly another name which bears close semblance to the usual word. Now we move on to the next figure of speech which is called the transferred epithet. When the title itself tells us that there is a transfer or a shift of something which is an epithet. Epithet is nothing but an adjective. So there is a shift of an adjective from one entity to another. Let's look at the following sentences. He went along the weary way. Who it is who is weary? It is he who is weary. But the weariness he shifted from him to the way. Okay, so the way is called weary. Similarly, the second one. In the second sentence, the epithet tireless or the adjective tireless is shifted from the Indian team who were tireless and then it shifted to efforts. In the third sentence also, there is a shift of epithet losing from they to the battle. Actually, they it is they who were losing, but it is shifted from them to the word battle. So, here we see that there is a shift of an adjective, very clearly an adjective from one entity to, entity to another. So, therefore, transferred epithet is when an adjective usually trans used to describe one thing is transferred to another. Usually, it is found that transferred epithet is confused with personification saying that how can a way be weary? So, way is showing human qualities. How can efforts be tireless? So, efforts are showing human qualities. No. Here we need to understand that personification is very clearly, very clearly an action performed. A, an action that only a living being can perform is performed by an inanimate object. 
here we see that an adjective is transferred. So whenever you see an adjective before a noun and we say that okay it is you get confused with personification you have to see whether it is in the place of an adjective if it is an adjective then very clearly it is transferred epithet but if an inanimate object is showing to is seen to perform some action then it is personification so now we move on to the next figure of speech which is a very simple yet highly confusing uh, people generally get confused with this concept this is alliteration. It's not usually confusion, but it is, you know, a mistaking. Uh, uh, people do make mistakes in identifying alliteration. So let's look at the following sentences. She is a careful cat. Now, careful cat. The next one, the race had a photo finish. Third one, maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. Now, this is a tagline of uh, a very famous fashion product. Now, let's see. What is the similarities in all three sentences? She is a careful cat. Now, careful cat, you see a repetition of a sound or a consonant sound K. Here in the second sentence, we see a repetition of the consonant sound of F, photo finish. And in the third one, maybe, maybe, maybe is repeated. So there is not repetition of words, it's a repetition of the sound for greater poetic effect. Now, this is very important that though they may not begin with the same letter. Now, you can photo finish. Photo begins with PH and finish begins with F. Yet, we find that they are pronounced the same way, photo finish. Therefore, this is an alliteration. So, not necessarily that they should begin with a similar uh, letter. So, now let's define alliteration. It is defined as a repetition of the same consonant sounds at the beginning of words that are in close proximity to each other. They have to be in close proximity to each other and not in the first sentence and then the last sentence. No. We go on to the next figure of speech and that is tautology. It is usually considered as the use of, you know, uh, redundant language. You know why? Because why waste vocabulary when you can do with one word? Now, tautology, if you look at the following sentences, you'll see what I mean. He fled into the wide, vast world. Why do you need to use wide and vast when both mean the same? You could have just very clearly said he fled into the vast world. But wide, vast world. Therefore, people felt it was a you know redundant use of words. It's a very bad way of using language. But then later on, people found that, well, it is really useful. Next one. The king looked after the meek and the mild. It had just said the meek but the meek and the mild. Now, here again, these two words are similar in meaning. Now, when you see that they are used, in fact, they kind of emphasize on what the person is saying. So, to create greater emphasis and sometimes more musical effect, this tautology is used. Similarly, the third one, please repeat and reiterate it. Emphasis, repeat, reiterate. They both, they all, all three of them also look like alliteration, but we must know that tautology is mainly seen here because words having same meaning are used in the same sentence. So, how do we define it? It's a repetitive use of phrases or words that have similar meanings. Let's see what's the next one. The next one is a pun. Next figure of speech. Now, pun is something that is really a very beautiful use of language in order to mean many things. Now, let's see the first one. A happy life depends upon the liver. The word liver has two different meanings. Now, the first meaning is actually the organ of a person, of a body, that is liver. Another meaning of liver is the one who lives a life. Look at the second sentence. Now, water matters. Now, matters, water matters. It matters could also mean, could mean information, while matters could also mean that something is significant to our lives. So, matters. It matters to our life. So, water matters. Some people use just simple words like this and they mean a lot, a whole world in it. So, water matters. This is a pun. He will sing after he breaks the record. Now, see now, after he breaks the record, which means it could li literally mean a real breaking or, you know, cutting of a record or it could be breaking his own record that he had set or breaking a record that was set before. So, if you see here, there are words which are used and they have two different meanings. 
there are some words which have similar sound though they may be spelled differently such words are also used in some contexts so what is a pun it's a play on words very clearly a play on words that sometimes produces a humorous effect by using a word that suggests two meanings or by exploiting similar sounding words but they have different meanings okay now the last one that we are going to do is epigram what is epigram now these epigrams are actually words of wisdom people who contemplate on situations and contexts they come up with some words of wisdom based on their experience and these words of wisdom never fail to touch people and people find it memorable they remember it at certain different times in life look at the first one i can resist everything but temptation very thoughtful it makes you rethink about the statement go back to the statement and think about it again look at the second one mankind must put an end to war or war will put an end to mankind as said by john f kennedy now here also if you find you know it makes you go back to the sentence again and reread it so that you understand it better these are not very long sentences yet they convey a lot of meaning so what is epigram it refers to a concise witty memorable and sometimes surprising or satirical statement so you know it actually makes it startles you sometimes you know the way it is said so such statements are called epigrams now what we have done we have done about 10 figures of speech through this presentation i hope you have understood thank you very much for your attention